Tenet. Fuck. You may feel like Tenet is hella confusing, and I agree with you, but only in the way that it's told. Tenet is actually a straightforward movie masquerading as a mindfuck. Yeah, I said it. I spent countless hours with this movie, and I feel like once you can crack the codes of Tenet, you end up with this really awesome, fully digestible heist film filled with adventure and beautiful IMAX cinematography and fantastic music. I mean, you've got three. Count them, three heists in this movie, including going backwards and doing one of them again in reverse. I mean, Tenet slaps ass. So as the movie explicitly tells you, Don't try to understand it. Feel it. Which means that the nitty gritty details of how this time travel mechanic works or what that muffled line of dialogue meant what are we better put out really don't matter. You can still enjoy the ride without trying to understand it. Having said that, we're gonna try and understand it. I'm gonna boil it all down so you don't have to. So grab a nice cup of hot cocoa, a box of Jolly Ranchers, and let's fucking boil. We're gonna be talking about time travel. We're gonna be talking about the characters. We're gonna be talking about all the what the fuck is going on in this film that appears in the film. Disclaimer number one, there are time-coded chapters down below and time has no meaning, so feel free to jump around as you please. Disclaimer number two, all of my explanations are just based on my own digging through the film, so I could always be wrong. If you have different takes on any of this, please yell them at me in the comments. I mean, really let me have it. I like it. Disclaimer number three, I'm gonna spoil the absolute tits off of this movie, so just be aware. I mean, like, literally, I'm gonna give away the ending of the movie in like five seconds. So, what the hell is any of this? Just, what? I mean, it's hard enough to understand the movie without, you know, subtitles. But then you've got all these names and concepts being thrown at you on top of that. So let's first boil down some basics in a segment I like to call Categories of Confusion. Now I easily could have made this video five times longer than it is, so I am gonna skip over a lot of stuff that I think is self-explanatory. First of all, the story of Tenet is a time loop. What happens happened. Whatever happened, happened. Who says? Essentially, you can't change things. If you go back in time to try and change something, then whatever you do, is just what always happened. Now the characters debate whether or not this is truly the case, but ultimately it is. What's happened, happened. I get it now. Next up, the method of time travel that the characters in the movie use is called inversion, which means that an object or person moves backwards in time. And those people and objects are inverted using this device called the turnstile. And the turnstile can also be used to de-invert people, bringing them back to normal, aka moving forward in time, which Tenet refers to as conventional. Now throughout the video, I'll be showing you various clips from the movie, including scenes that move conventionally, scenes that move inversely, and I'll also be reversing footage to show you scenes in a new way. So to make sure it's always clear what we're seeing, I'm gonna use these little icons in the bottom right corner. Red means the world in that scene is moving forward. Blue means moving backwards, regardless of whether or not characters in the scene are inverted. For example, in this scene, the sob crashes in reverse, but the world that we're seeing is moving forward. Now, if I reverse the footage, the car crashes conventionally, but we're seeing the world in reverse, so the icon will be blue. I'm also not gonna use the icons in scenes that are obviously just forward moving conventional scenes. Now this is Plutonium 241. Well, not really. For like the first half of the movie, characters refer to it as Plutonium or 241. Plutonium 241. But that is completely false. This is a Plutonium. What it actually is, is a piece of a device called the algorithm. Simply put, if the algorithm is used, the world ends. More on that later. The important thing is whenever anybody says plutonium or 241, they're referring to this specific piece of the algorithm. Tenet is the name of an organization whose mission is to save the world by stopping the algorithm from being used. Essentially the good guys. Then there are the bad guys, a mysterious group from the future who we don't ever see and we don't really have a name for, so we'll just call them the antagonists. While Tenet wants to stop the algorithm from being used, the antagonists want to use that shit. They love it. Lastly, something else that made my brain go when I was watching this movie for the first time, was that we're introduced to several key players in the story without ever having met them. 
and then we're given extensive exposition about them, still without ever having seen them. So? Let's boil, baby! John David Washington plays the main character. We don't know his name, and he's simply referred to as the protagonist. Protagonist. But I'm just gonna call him P because that's four syllables, three of which I don't got time for. P is a good person with good intentions. Now I told you I was gonna spoil the whole movie right up top, and here it goes. Last chance. I'm doing it now. So in the end, we find out that P is the leader and founder of Tenet. I realized I wasn't working for you. We've both been working for me. Or he will be. He isn't yet. It's time travel. Neil, played by Robert Pattinson, is also a good person, through and through. P questions his loyalties throughout the film. Somebody talked! Who was it? Was it you? But this all turns out to be unwarranted. You never did tell me who recruited you, Neil. I only guessed by now. You did. See, Neil is from the future, where he works for P. But because the movie is taking place before Tenet is founded, P is just getting started, and presumably Neil needs to keep P in the dark about certain things, otherwise it would mess up the future. If I told him he acted differently, who knows? P has to go through these experiences before founding Tenet. Andre Sater, played by Kenneth Branagh, is the main villain of the story. Speaking of not knowing who people are, we don't see Sater's face until 53 minutes into the film. So Sater communicates with the antagonists in the future. He's their representative in the present. I believe he's functioning as some sort of a broker between our time and the future. Kat, played by Elizabeth Debicki, is one of the main heroes of the story. She's married to Sater and they fucking hate each other. <laughs> A happy marriage. Priya is a high-ranking member of Tenet, whose goal is to save the world, but ultimately turns out to be a no-good stinker. More on that later. So, my goal is to demystify this movie to the point that even if you don't understand every little detail, you understand the point of every scene. Now we're going to run through the whole movie scene by scene. Shit only takes about... Now we start things off with a doozy of a sequence. When we're first introduced to P, he's CIA working undercover for these rude Ukrainian men, and then working undercover again as Ukrainian SWAT. So look, I'm not gonna get too much into who the fuck any of these guys are. Partly because I don't want to, and partly because it's unknowable. There are whole videos out there breaking down just this one sequence, and I could give extensive details about it but it would be largely guesswork on my part. So instead, let's just stick to what we know and a few key details that are gonna be important going forward in the story. Also, you can think of the opera sequence as a representation of the fact that P is about to become immersed in this overwhelming world that he can't yet understand. So simply put, good guys, good guy, bad guys, bad guys, bad guys probably, good guy, bad guy, good guy, Good guys, bad guy, sometimes bullets move backwards and my worldview means nothing, good guy. So P and pals blend in with the real SWAT team only to discover that the real SWAT team is kind of fuck asses because they try and gas and blow up the audience. Not very cool. Is the entire SWAT team made up of these dirty agents? Unclear. So P and his team's real mission as undercover CIA is to find this guy, who is simply referred to as the well-dressed man. Some or all of the siege is supposedly a diversion in order to get rid of him. A diversion by whom? Unclear. So P rescues him as well as recovers the supposed plutonium-241. The CIA extract the well-dressed man while one of their agents takes his place and joins P to disarm the bombs. Neil appears and shoots P's captor with an inverted bullet. The rude men realize this is not the well-dressed man and proceed to torture him and P. Why do the rude men want the well-dressed man? Unclear. Which of the factions at the Opera Siege are working for Seder? Unclear. Are the rude men and possibly other factions actually sent by Tenet to test P? Unclear. A test. They pull my teeth out. Meanwhile, off-screen, the other CIA agents offload the 241 to Ukrainian authorities. Seta tried to lift the only loose 241 from under the CIA team at the Opera Siege in Kiev. He got the team. Not the 241. Who did? Ukrainian security services. And are then caught and killed by Sater's men. We got the team. Did my team get clear? No. Private Russians, we think. Here are some things that we want to remember from this sequence. Number one, we see what kind of person P is. 
He abandons his mission at the drop of a hat to save the audience from the bombs. Taking out the audience. It's just the cheap seats. And our mission. It's mine now. And I like that. Number two, Sater was trying to walk away from this with 241, but he didn't. So he's going to have to steal it later. Number three, Sater was apparently here at this time. He was in Ukraine. At the Kiev Opera Siege. Or in the area, down the street, at the mall. If you say so. All I have for you is a gesture in combination with a word, Tenet. Now this moment is P being inducted into Tenet. Anytime somebody knows this gesture, it means they're a part of Tenet. Agent Faye here is sent by Tenet to recruit P. But as he says here, Tenet is founded on this notion of nobody ever having the full scope of things. This is knowledge divided. This is possibly born out of P's own paranoia of being betrayed. How I talk? Did you talk? How do you know about that? It's hard to take things on trust from people speaking half-truths. That's not fair. This is a theme we see throughout the film, which hypothetically led him to build those principles into Tenet. Off-screen, P is instructed on where and how to find the lab technician, who explains inversion to him. It's inverted. Its entropy runs backwards. You have to have dropped it. How can it move before I touch it? From your point of view, you caught it, but from the bullet's point of view, you dropped it. The way I see it, he can't just stick his hand out and expect something to happen. He has to imagine himself dropping it, even though it hasn't happened yet and it'll happen in reverse. He still needs to make a conscious choice for it to happen. Just like when someone shoots an inverted round, the bullet hole wouldn't be there if no one had fired. Off screen, Fleur gives P the information about where the bullets came from, which leads him to an arms dealer in Mumbai. Once there, P asks his CIA contact for help. I need an assist in Mumbai. Presumably, word of this gets to Tenet and they send Neil. I'm Neil. I need an audience with Sanjay Singh. We learn that Sanjay's wife, Priya, is the actual arms dealer with her husband as a front. But in spite of that, Priya informs P that Sater is the one from whom the bullets originated. The dealer you're looking for is Andre Sater. So Priya convinces P that his mission is to find out what Sater's plot is. But Priya actually knows all about the 241, the algorithm, and Sater's plan to help the antagonists use it. She's playing a much longer game trying to acquire the entire algorithm by letting Sater collect the pieces. You want Sater to get the last section. That is the only way he'll bring together the other eight. She knows her actions here will lead to that. Priya then tells Pete that she has a contact in British intelligence who can help, who we discover is Michael Caine. She then gives P information on how to find Michael Caine. I have a contact who's out of Sater's reach. Just wait, she's about to tell him how to contact him. Wait, hold on, go back. Did she, wait, did she tell him right, right there? Or did she tell him like, between here and here? But why would he, if he didn't already, how did he know where to find him if she didn't, did she tell him like, like there? Well, they don't call him Christopher gives no fucks and Nolan for nothing. So now Michael Caine introduces us to important characters with a lot of information that we can't process because we've never met these people in our lives. So let's dazzle this scene up with some visual aids. I gather you have an interest in a certain Russian national. Anglo-Russian. His wife. Catherine Barton. I assume you're familiar with the Soviet era secret cities. Most of them have been opened up and renamed as regular towns. Not the one Sato grew up in. Stalsk 12. So Stalsk 12 is Sater's hometown where he grew up, and it's where the final battle sequence of the movie takes place. Two weeks ago, the same day as the Kiev Opera Siege, we spotted a detonation in northern Siberia, just where Stalsk 12 was. That detonation that he just mentioned? That's the bomb that goes off at the end of the movie. The movie just started and it already happened. In fact, it happened the day of the first scene. This, and this, and this, all happen on the same day. It's the 14th, 10 days ago. It could mean that that point in time inherently contains some sort of cosmic significance, almost as if it were the temporal junction point of the entire space-time continuum. On the other hand, it could just be an amazing coincidence. Our characters will later travel back in time to fight this battle. They're carrying a Goya in a Herod's bag. It's a fake by a Spaniard named Arepo. 
Oh, right. So this is Art Forger Arepo, who... Well, he's not in the movie, so we don't know what he looks like, but... You know what? Fuck it. He's Diego Luna, because I said so. So Kat and Arepo were having an affair, probably. Thompson and the came close. Maybe too close. So Kat works for Shipley Art Gallery. We know that she authenticates works of art. Now, Arepo tried to rip Sater off by getting him to buy one of his forged paintings, presumably so that he and Kat could run away together. And Kat didn't even know he did that. Did you know the drawing was a fake? No. Yeah. The forgery was so good that Kat actually authenticated it. Sater caught on to this, killed Arepo, maybe. If you'd actually met Arepo as you claimed, you'd understand he no longer walks anyway. And now holds Kat hostage by threat of turning her in for this crime that she participated in. The drawing is his hold over me. So she stays with Sater in order to remain in her son's life and keep him safe from Sater's bad influence. After Sater's men try to beat up P and do an absolute muppet of a job, Kat begins helping P. The deal is this. Kat will introduce P to Sater, and in exchange, P will steal the blackmail painting back for her. She agrees and tells P where the painting is being stored. The Freeport is in an airport, which is one of several that Kat manages for a company called Rotus, which is owned by Sater, but she doesn't know that because she can't spell backwards. Sater stores valuable items at the Freeport, so Kat thinks the painting's there, which it's not. The instinct told me to remove it from the vault. But what is there is a turnstile. Space in the center of the Pentagon is too big. Hey, there's something there. Can't figure it out. It's just not marked. And this is why Sater built the Freeports in the first place. So in order to sneak into the Freeport, Neil and P, or Neil, have to trigger a security lockdown with them inside posing as clients. Because once inside, all of the doors are just regular locks that Neil can pick. Pick the locks. It's Charles Burrell. So their colleague, Mahir, crashes an airplane into the side of the airport and triggers that lockdown with Neil inside. So Neil and P find their way to the mysterious room at the center of the Freeport that P saw on the blueprints, and they find the turnstile that Sater secretly built into the Freeport. They see bullet holes and the remains of a battle that hasn't happened yet. The turnstile opens, and someone comes out of both sides. Which we later learn is two iterations of P himself. They were the same person. Confused as to how two people who are also the same person can appear out of thin air? Just you wait. So inverted P comes out, and um, and the two of them, they're um, well. So what they're, or so how that works is that um, you know what? We'll come back to that. So P and Priya meet up again, or Papriya. The gist of this is she's still pretending P's mission is to find out what Sater's up to. She then goes on to tell him that the 241 ended up in the hands of an organization called the Ukrainian Security Services, and that it's soon going to be transported. So Kat makes good on her deal and invites P to dinner. Fun! Sater is very rude, but P gets his attention by implying he knows stuff about things. Do you like opera? The next day, P, Sater, and Kat go sailing on this the this um spaceship now this scene is one of the most notoriously hard to hear and is also confusing even with the subtitles but essentially all you need to know is that p wants to partner with Sater, and Sater declines because he suspects p of being cia and then this of course and that's it now you can relax and enjoy this lovely scene Back on the boat, Cat is rightfully pissed off at P because he didn't let Sater die, nor did he find the painting. So sater has been getting missions from the antagonists in the future through these time capsules for years, which they send back to him with instructions, inverted weapons, and fat stacks of gold nugs. My theory is that this is actually how he made his billions, but no way to know for sure. Sater finally agrees to hire P to steal the 241. I spring the material. You pay me off. P will steal the 241 back for him from... Uh... Ukrainian security services. I actually don't know who. Whoever has it now. This guy. And also this guy. Who knows? Doesn't matter. All that matters is these are the fools that need to get stolen from. Sater obviously assumes that P will then hand the 241 over to him once he's stolen it, but... Side note, Sater knows this CIA phrase. But we do live in a twilight world. My theory is that it's because he's worked with the CIA before in some capacity. He's tapped into the intelligence services. 
So we're on to heist number two. Steal 241 back from people. Do it on a highway. Fuck yeah. Not much else to say. It's awesome. They retrieve the 241 and the movie hits us with one of these. I can't understand this. You said you spoke Estonian. It's not Estonian. It's backwards. I gotta gush again. This part right here, when I first saw it, despite my confusion, the movie had me. This is the sweet spot of the film where you still don't really understand inversion. And so all of a sudden you hear someone talking backwards and it has this like creepy alien feel to it. It doesn't seem quite human because people don't do that. And when the car first appears, it's so mysterious and strange. It almost feels like a horror movie in this moment. The music and the sound all make it feel like it's this monster. Just watch and listen to how the music introduces the car. It's backwards. What the hell is that? It like gives you the creeps. And then the sound design for when the car itself flips around. <laughs> Up until now, we'd really only experienced inversion as it pertained to a gun or this one weird flailing person at the Freeport who almost kind of seemed like maybe he was a zombie or something. We didn't know. But this is our first time experiencing someone who is clearly using inversion as a tool and a nefarious one at that. This scene is almost exactly at the halfway point of the movie, which in screenwriting terms usually means we're introduced to someone or something new, which makes perfect sense here because we are now truly entering the world of inversion. And honestly, I feel like the movie is only just getting started here. So friendly reminder. Don't give it to him. This is a platonium. It's worse than that, goddammit. Neil is from the future. And he knows all about 241, but he just needs to let P discover it for himself, which is why he's so secretive. So P removes the 241 from the case and tosses it to Seder. He then tosses the actual 241 to himself in the Saab. So ultimately, Seder's men capture P and Kat and bring them both to the Freeport where... Wait a sec, is that Zack Snyder? Anyway, Zack brings P into the red side of the turnstile room, where he's then interrogated by Sater, who's on the blue side. Now again, in this film, red represents conventional forward movement, whereas blue represents inverse backwards movement. That doesn't mean that these rooms themselves are moving in different directions. The only real difference between the rooms is that the blue side is pumping inverted air, which is why inverted Sater can breathe without a mask, but conventional cat needs one. But how does this interrogation work? Tell me now, is it really in the BMW? I don't know. Tell me or I'll shoot her again. Well, let's start with what we know. This room is clearly set up to record the questions and answers and play them back in reverse for the opposite side so that both sides of the conversation can be understood. But let's look at a diagram. So we've got Seder up there, cute. We've got P down there, adorable. So remember that Seder in the blue section is moving backwards, aka left, and P in the red section is moving forward, aka right. If we look at this exchange from P's perspective. You left it in the car, not the fire truck, right? I told you that! And then the same exchange on the blue side. You left it in the car, not the fire truck, right? Who told you that? We see that Seder is actually hearing the answer to his question. But if we look at this diagram going right to left, wouldn't P answer the question before Seder even asked it? It wouldn't make any sense. Well, all they would need to do is delay P's answers as they play on the blue side until after Seder asks his questions, which could be done by software or maybe some lonely technician in the back room, then everything works. So let's test it. If we focus on just the events in the blue side, moving right to left, does it make sense? First, P answers the question, but it's not translated, so Seder can ignore it. Then Seder asks his question, and then P answers it. And then if we watch the events in the red side from left to right, sure enough, P hears the question and then answers it. To him, it's fairly straightforward. How is it useful to interrogate someone in reverse? The way I see it, the interrogation can be twice as useful. Conventionally, the questions are driving P to give the answers, which he ultimately gives. Okay, okay, 
The car. So then, inversely, Sater can reuse this time to try and confirm that answer. Tell me now, is it really in the BMW? I don't know. You left it in the car, not the fire truck, right? The reason that all of this shit is so confusing is because I don't think we were ever meant to understand it. Not in a condescending gatekeeping way, but because it's thematically important that we don't. Think about it. The point of this scene is to show that P is devastatingly outmatched at this point. His adversary has tools and skills that he can't even comprehend. He doesn't know what the fuck's going on and neither do we. We see these things happening and we're just like, and we empathize with P's feeling of powerlessness in this situation. This is an important moment for any movie with a decent villain. The movie has to prove to us that beating them is gonna be a challenge because it wouldn't be satisfying if it was easy. But here's the best part. This pays off at the end of the movie when P and company use these very same tactics of satyrs against him. Our hero grows and learns and eventually becomes formidable enough to take down the enemy that seemed unbeatable. I think Nolan charts a path through this movie that doesn't give you a lot of answers, but he leaves you clues along the way to understand it if you choose to. Hope you'll be happy. So when you go through a turnstile, you're you uh, around and then you go into on, on the other side, but then you're not on the, the, the one side, but now you're on. So you, you, you're going, you have any ibuprofen? Vicodin? Yeah. It was really hard to wrap my brain around this the first time I saw it because Sater enters the turnstile from the red side, aka the conventional side, but to our eyes, he also appears to enter the turnstile on the blue side, aka the inverted side. And then when the turnstile's open, he's just gone. Well, you have to look at it like this. When Sater enters the turnstile on the red side, he's moving forward in time like normal. But when we see him enter the turnstile on the blue side, the rules are broken. Everything is reversed. He's not entering the turnstile, he's reverse exiting the turnstile. When we see him moving from left to right in this room, for him, he's actually moving right to left. He didn't go into the turnstile, he came out of it. So when P asks, where did he go? Here. He left. But to our normie ass eyeballs, it looked like he was arriving. And then it cuts back to the present and Kat's still sitting there, even though it looked like Sater just took her out. Well, yeah, because for him, that's him leaving. But for Kat, it's reversed. So let's just take a look. Let's follow Sater through the entire event. He kicks Cat, then he goes and hides in the little room, which I think is because if he overhears anything during the red half of the interrogation, it'll mess up how he approaches the blue half. He comes out, he finishes the interrogation with P, not knowing at all how it went. Also, brief tangent here, it's hard to understand why Sater says, Which vehicle did you leave it in? I need to know before I go out there. Because to our eyes, the interrogation already happened. Why does he need the answer before going to get the answer? But since he's going in reverse, this is the end of the interrogation. Everything on the blue side was building to this moment. So what Sater's saying is, before I restart the interrogation, I need to know that I succeeded. Then he enters the turnstile, inverts. Now he goes through the interrogation in reverse. He takes Cat with him. Ah. <laughs> Then he uses the information he got in the interrogation. It's in the glove box! But we know that that's a lie. I lied. And he tells his men this. The material is not in this. Get the other sections of the algorithm to the hypocenter. <laughs> Then he and Zach go from the conventional car to the inverted SUV. And then he proceeds to do the rest of the highway chase inverted. Where did he go? Lost. So we're introduced to Ives and some other tenant soldiers. P demands that they invert Cat because someone who's been shot with an inverter round can only heal if they are inverted. Anyway, P inverts. One of the first things that happens when P steps out as an inverted person in the normal world is he steps in this puddle and it looks like this. Think of inversion this way. The world obeys forward movement. Because the environment essentially flows in our direction, we dominate. 
So something moving in reverse has to still obey those rules. It seems really hard to comprehend that P can unstep in a puddle or unsmash a car's taillight. But just remember that anything he does when inverted is something that has to have already happened in conventional time. Check out him scaring these pedestrians with his car. To them, all they see is some weirdo trying to drive his car backwards down the street. Another thing I never realized the first several times watching this movie was that when Neil asks for the shipping container, so why don't you find us a nice, cozy shipping container? We see it here, and it's lined with plastic. Same with later when they're traveling on the barge. Can't get over the birds. All of this is put in place so that inverted people don't need to be breathing through a mask all the time. These areas are filled with inverted air. It just goes to show how much work Nolan and company put into selling this world. To the point that I'm still noticing attention to detail after a dozen times watching this movie. Could also just be because I'm stupid. Okay, so back to P's point of view on the highway. P takes out his earpiece and puts it in the orange case, which he knows that Sater's men in the conventional car dropped off. Therefore, now that P is moving in reverse, they will undrop it off and P can listen into their conversation. So now P chases down Sater on the highway, only this time in reverse. Of course, now we know that P is the one who flipped the sob in the earlier scene, but now the car flips conventionally, even though we're seeing the world inverted. So remember, P got into the sob at the Freeport, and when he encounters his original self, that original version of him throws the 241 into the sob. So the 241 was already in the car when P got into it. So why doesn't P find the 241 at this moment? The script actually says that P looks for the 241 and finds nothing, only to later discover that it was actually wedged down the side of a seat where he couldn't see it. So since P didn't discover the 241, it's still sitting there in the car at the Freeport. Sater's men can simply go back there later in conventional time and pick it up. We actually know this is what he's gonna do because earlier in the movie, when Neil says this, I can't understand this. You said you spoke Estonian. It's not Estonian. Backwards. If we reverse the footage, we actually hear Sater saying this. That's not a... That's not a... It was a nice little clue that we got early on, even though we couldn't have possibly understood it. It's the thought that counts. So the team discusses the algorithm. What the algorithm does is it flips the flow of time in the world, not just for a single object or person. Everything. The world itself. It can invert the entropy of the world. The way we just established that the puddle has to splash in forward motion, this would reverse that and everything else in the world. Neil describes it as everyone and everything is ever lived, destroyed instantly. And introduces the grandfather paradox, which means that the future theoretically can't destroy us because we're their ancestors. If we die, they cease to exist. But no one knows for sure, so the antagonists still think they can do it. Doesn't us being here now mean it never happens? But we stopped them. Optimistically, I'd say that's right. So what the friggin' heck is he talking about? From the optimistic point of view, it must be that we win the war. Because what's happened has happened. And the world we live in would already be inverted if it was ever going to be inverted. But from the pessimistic point of view, he says this. Pessimistically? In a parallel world theory, we can't know the relationship between consciousness and multiple realities. Which I think means we could remain conscious up until the point when the algorithm is used. Our reality here could potentially coexist with a reality in which we're destroyed. So your head hurt you. You're just not thinking fourth dimensionally. Right, right, I have a real problem with that. Okay, so now we're back at the vault where... You know what, we'll come back to that. Ah, oh, shit. Fuck. Oh my god. Time to talk about the backwards vault scene. This scene seems like it must have been the giantest clusterfuck when shooting this movie. I don't think anyone but Nolan understood what was happening, including the actors, the cinematographer, 
the editor, the producer, us, God. Chris was talking to me about best way to first approach it. He's like, so you should put a fight together of one guy fighting another guy, moving forward, play that backwards, take the other guy away, have the guy who was first attacking watch the video, then have him do the routine perfectly backwards, then have somebody attack him and then flip that film and that's your fight scene. I just don't have enough folds in my brain to do that. What's interesting about this scene is that every punch, every kick, every move is both reactive and proactive at the same time. Doing something passive when you're conventional can equal doing something aggressive when you're inverted and vice versa. Back in that initial fight sequence, Inverted P uses the force to grab his gun. He unflips himself over his shoulders to get the upper hand, and he does this creepy backwards crawling thing, followed by a scary grab. But when we see these moments in reverse, we actually see that the creepy crawl and the scary grab were actually him getting kicked by conventional P and desperately trying to get his gun back. That unflip move shows inverted P actually getting owned. And the force gun pull is actually just him deconstructing the gun and throwing it away in order to protect them both, which presumably is also why he shoots the glass in that scene to try and unload the clip. It's a nice realization that for as many times as he thought he was losing in that initial battle, he was also winning. Another note is that deconstruction of the gun is actually something P does in the very first scene of the movie. So when we see it happen in reverse in that initial fight sequence, it's actually another subtle hint to the fact that that is P. P de-inverts, we see Neil chase him, and then he exits the airport and he gives the all clear to inverted Neil. Go. So we're seeing P say go, forwards and then reverse. I think the simplest way to look at this is that this moment is the halfway point in the middle of the vault sequence. P and Neil both started at the end working their way backwards. P spent that second half fighting with his conventional self, whereas Neil was waiting here outside. When P exits, he's conventional now, so this version is about to head to the van to wait for Neil and Kat at the end of everything. And this version is that same thing, just in reverse. Now, having been given the go-ahead, Neil is going to make his way through the first half of the vault sequence, during which time their previous selves are preoccupied. Neil de-inverts with Cat, they meet P outside, and we're off. Cat's healed and we're moving forward once again. I want to note here that throughout the film, P often suspects that he's part of this grand conspiracy. But in the end, it's a lot simpler than that. P and Neil aren't just pawns in Tenet's big game. They are Tenet. Policy is to suppress. Whose policy? Ours, my friend. <laughs> So, off screen, the team meets up with Ives, inverts yet again so they can go back in time and stop Seder. Tell me you're gonna kill him. In this scene, our characters learn what the stakes really are. The short answer? He dies, the world ends. The long answer? If Seder dies, his health tracker will send out an email to the antagonist telling them where the algorithm is buried, thus allowing them to later dig it up, use it in the future, reversing the flow of time, destroy us all, and bing bang boom, dead's your grandpa. So like we said in the beginning, Seder was apparently present at or around the Kiev Opera Siege, but... He was in Ukraine. At the Kiev Opera Siege. Find us, it wasn't on his yard. So that's his window. To go back to that golden moment, happy as last. So the team deduces that since Seder is already dying, he will go back to this treasured moment on the yacht with Kat, then kill himself and the world in one poetic act. I'm fucking dick. This next scene is so hard to understand, it might as well be in a different language. But without knowing where the dead drop is, why don't we better put it out the hole before the bomb goes off, thing? So I'm gonna provide some visual aid and we're gonna boil that shit down. This time, we're working our way back to the full team, but without knowing where the dead drop is, there's only so much I can do to prepare. You know what a hypercenter is? It's ground zero for an underground nuclear test. Sir Michael Crosby told me about a detonation in stock 12 on the 14th. The dead drop is at the bottom of the hypercenter. That explosion seals up the algorithm. Well, then we better put it out of the hole before the bomb goes off, thanks. 
Lieutenant is going to storm Stalsk 12 both conventionally and inverted. This is where the heroes use the temporal pincer movement against Seder, like we said he was going to earlier in the video. Here we see blue team being dropped off. I actually love this. Before the sequence even begins, we see how it ends. This right here, this is P and Ives getting dragged out of the hypo center by Neil. I mean, forget seeing the explosion at the beginning of the sequence. We heard about the explosion at the beginning of the movie. Two weeks ago, we spotted a detonation in Stealth 12. I know it doesn't give away the ending per se, but I still love that they do it. So the helicopters here appear to be moving backwards because they are conventional, whereas the soldiers are inverted. Dropping them off means picking them up. Now, the conventional soldiers are arriving as the inverted soldiers are leaving. Picking them up means dropping them off. Look, if it doesn't make sense to you, don't be alarmed. That indicates only that you are still sane. So the Tenet soldiers fight the battle at Stalsk 12. Meanwhile, P and Ives, or Pives, are the splinter unit. Their mission is this. Sneak into the hypo center, steal the algorithm without anybody knowing, which the Tenet team assists with by using this as a distraction. And letting the bomb go off as planned. If they fail, the antagonists in the future will later dig it up and use it. If they succeed, the antagonists in the future will dig it up, no algorithm. Well, they succeed, and everything's good after that, and nobody has any questions about anything at all after that. Shit! Ass! We now arrive at arguably the most confusing scene in the entire movie. Here's what happens. Pives arrive in the hypo center. And there's a big ass locked door. We don't have anything big enough to blow this. Sater's henchman is on the other side, and there's a dead man lying on the floor. It's Neil. Rest in peace. What? Sater is rude to pee over the radio, and Sater's henchman arms the bomb that will seal the algorithm. It's all pretty straightforward until this happens. So what the fuck ass just happened? Flash forward to the end scene, Neil realizes he must be the one who has to unlock the door down in the hypo center. So after realizing this, Neil re-inverts off screen, re-enters the hypo center, this time inverted, and from his perspective, this happens. Neil catches a bullet and dies, but saves P and the entire world. Now, what you've just seen is what constitutes unlocking the door. Now, from a story standpoint, we can just, you know. Don't try to understand it. Then it's fine. It makes enough sense, just like the rest of the movie. Neil sacrifices himself, saves the world. What else do you need to know? But daddy's got a tea kettle with this scene's name on it. So what literally happened in that scene? Unfortunately, I don't have a concrete answer for you, but I do have a few theories. Theory number one, he somehow unlocks it as he's standing with it open. This would make sense for time, he would have enough time to do it, but in reverse, would that not be like he's locking it? Theory number two, Neil unlocks the door as soon as he arrives at the hypocenter. You would think that that makes the most sense, but if we reverse the footage, as soon as he gets there, it's, I guess it's closed and then it's like this, like it's fast and it's kind of like, I don't know, fast and there's, it's instant, like less than an instant, like it, it's, it's faster than instantaneous. So did he, so how? So that brings us to theory number three. When he arrives, the door is already open. He simply closes it at just the right time. And 
knowing that in conventional time, that will equal the door unlocking. I am a little on the fence about this theory because we do have numerous moments in the film foreshadowing Neil's lockpicking abilities. In a door's revert to factory settings. Unpickable locks. Oh, it's Charles Burry. Look at the hand. Actually, yes. I'm the only one who could have got that door open in time, right, Ives? Well, I don't know any locksmiths as good as you. See? And if you follow this theory, he didn't really pick any locks. The job was already done when he got there. But I guess one way to look at it is that this is more of a cinematic example of his ability. We already know he's an expert, so it's almost fitting that his final act is a combination of inversion and lock stuff. But I'd certainly love to hear your thoughts. So P finally learns the truth that he himself is the leader of Tenet and Neil was on his side the whole time. You have a future in the past. Years ago for me, years from now for you. You've known me for years. So back on the boat, the upshot is, when Cat killed Seder, that would have doomed us all if P, Ives, and Neil, or Pavil, hadn't succeeded. But they did. And that's about it. Priya outs herself as a scumbag and tries to have Cat killed. Do it before the boy comes out. <gasps> which is thwarted by Cat leaving a message that P would receive off screen in the future. Kind of place, three o'clock. Probably nothing. Allowing for P to travel back in time and stop it. Can of place, three o'clock, probably nothing. Yes, you can. When you boil away all the confusing concepts and dialogue in Tenet, it really is a straightforward heist movie. At its core, you've got heroes and villains, a world-ending threat, and an emotional core. Maybe you don't agree, and that's fine. But hopefully you see what I mean. While working on this video, I found myself accidentally wasting a lot of time when I would start to watch a scene for research and completely forget what I was doing because I found myself engrossed in the movie all over again. And that's why I made this video. Because when I first saw Tenet, I felt like this movie I had been looking forward to was incomprehensible. But once I started to feel like I had a grasp on it, all that disappointment washed away and I started to really love it. And if you felt a similar disappointment, I just want you to be able to experience it like that too.